Welcome to Jesus and Me with Pastor Tom Harmon, who is the lead pastor of Kingsville Community Church. Here you will find relevant Bible teachings and practical training about being a follower of Jesus Christ. As Pastor mentioned, my name is Ron Davis. I uh, am serving in the International Office of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. I've been there about uh, 15 months or so now. Uh, having come to the office from British Columbia, we're saying we, were, we my wife and I felt very fortunate this winter that we were able to help set the record in February for the coldest month. Coming from the lower mainland of BC, that was somewhat of a challenge for us. It's not easy for us to do. I uh, spent the last 18 years prior to coming into this office as the District Secretary Treasurer for the BC Yukon District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Prior to that, we had the privilege of serving as church planters in Quebec, academic dean at the Bible College in Quebec, on church staffs in Saskatchewan, and then uh, leading a church in, on Vancouver Island. So we've had a variety of experience across the nation, and now um, God has given me a real passion for generosity, cultivating generosity within individuals and within churches. This is something that really, it gets my blood going, gets me excited, because as Pastor mentioned, this morning's presentation will be very practical for you. But I can tell you also that there will be nothing, nothing that you will hear in church more spiritual than what we will talk about this morning. And you'll see that as we go along. We're here to talk about something called rat radical stewardship. And it's radical not in the sense that it's wild and bizarre or crazy or out of this world or something that's beyond our reach to even accomplish. It's not radical in that sense. It's radical in that the word radical comes from radicalis, obviously, which means to be rooted. So what we want to share with you this morning is rooted in the scriptures. It's biblical financial principles. It's something that's probably also radical in the sense that it, it's going to be somewhat contrary to what you might hear in the world. Even this morning as you came to church, you got a lot of money messages. There were people telling you where you're going to go for lunch after church, which restaurant. There were people telling you where you should put your money and in what bank. There are people telling you what gr grocery store you should shop at, what hardware store you should shop at. There, there were all kinds of money messages out there, even as you drove to church this morning. But I think it's time that we added the message of the scriptures to what is being told throughout the world. What does the Bible tell us about our finances? Can we even use the M word in church? and talk about money. I'm hoping that this morning you'll open your hearts and open your ears as we talk about radical stewardship. So let's begin with scripture. This is going to test the limits of this. There we go. So do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let, let's maybe pause there. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is why I said this is probably one of the most spiritual topics you'll ever discuss. You and I choose what is a treasure. We make that decision. In this world, we have chosen that money Coins, gold, silver, those precious jewels, those are treasures. The point that we're making here is that whatever you decide is your treasure, your heart follows after. Those of you who are married, you know what I'm talking about. At some point you made a decision, wow, that person is worth pursuing. That person is worth getting to know. And so you went after that person, you decided that person was a treasure, and what do you know? You fell into love. 
But you didn't really fall into love. You made a decision and your heart followed after. Businessman was talking to his pastor one day and he said, Pastor, really appreciate how much you talk about missions. I, I think it's a great thing. We, we should be contributing to missions. But he says, you know, I, I just don't have a heart for missions. Pastor in his wisdom said to the businessman, tell you what, next Sunday is Mission Sunday. You put in a check for $10,000, you'll have a heart for missions. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We go on, no one can serve two masters, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. I have always marveled at this verse. Jesus could have said anything here. This is, this is the text. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you cannot serve God and the devil because they're natural adversaries. But he didn't say that. He, said, you cannot, he could have said, you, you cannot serve God and self because often our selfish ambitions get in the way of what God wants in our lives. But he didn't say that either. He said, you cannot serve God and money. It was like he was setting money up as that other God in our lives. Or at least has that potential to be that other God in our lives. To demand our worship, to demand our attention, to demand uh, those things that would r normally be given to God. We give to the pursuit of money. You cannot serve God in money. He, he's not saying that it's a bad thing, although it may be. And he's not saying that it's a difficult thing, although it certainly is. No, he says you can't do it. You cannot do it. It would be like me heading down that aisle and heading down that aisle at the same time. It can't be done. You cannot serve God and money. The Apostle Paul picks it up in his instructions to Timothy. And he says, command those who are rich in this present world. Not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good. There we go. To be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So what are these biblical principles for personal finances? Well, there's six of them that I want to share with you today. First one's called Find the Spot Marked X. Set some goals. In other words, you're going to find out where you are, find out where you want to go, create a financial plan. So how are we going to get there? Manage your spending. Want to know what, how we're making progress? And, and plan for retirement and do some final touches of state planning. Let's start with the first one. Find the Spot Marked X. It is very difficult to get where you're going or to follow directions if you don't know where you are. One of the things coming new into the Toronto Mississauga area is we have to discover, of course, where all the good shopping spots are. My wife insists on it. So we went to square one. And you come into a large mall that you have no idea where anything is or what, what, what's even there. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look for that thing called a directory. And you look on the directory to find the store that you want. And you, discover, you even look on the map where it is. And you, so you know where you want to go. But that really doesn't help you until you find that spot marked X. And right there it says those three words, you are here. Then you can find your way to where you're going. Same thing now in your personal finances. We want to find out where we are with our finances. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to be honest. If we're lost with our finances, we need to admit it. Do you know that over half of Ontarians live from paycheck to paycheck? In other words, if they skipped one paycheck, they'd be in serious financial trouble. They wouldn't be able to make the rent or the mortgage payment. Uh, they would maybe miss a car payment. They wouldn't maybe even have food on the, on the table. The, if one paycheck away from financial disaster. So if you're lost, let's be honest, let's admit it. And we need to be open 
Everything's on the table. No secret bank accounts, no, no secret uh, uh, expenditures, nothing like that. No extra credit card that nobody knows about. If we're going to find out where we are financial, then we need to be totally open about it. Secondly, we need to be thoughtful. How did we get to this situation? And, and maybe even you're in a good financial uh, circumstances. How did you get there? Remember the grace of God. Remember the gift of God. Be thankful. Even if you're in a good place, you need to take a moment and think about it. But if you're in a difficult spot, if, then you need to pause and find out, how did we get into this spot? Maybe it was no fault of your own. Maybe you ran into a health situation that just created extra financial burden. Maybe you're in a business situation that the other partner created difficulties for you. But regardless, you're here, so you need to know where you are. And maybe, it, maybe we did make some mistakes along the way. Maybe we did try and keep up with the Joneses. Maybe we did try and live beyond our means. And we need to recognize that. So we need to be thoughtful about it. The other thing is we need to recognize that there's a lot of emotion around money. If you want to start an argument start talking about money maybe even today as, as you found out that today's message was going to be about money you, you started to tighten up a little bit you know gentlemen you, you you shifted a little further over so you could sit on that wallet a little tighter money evokes a lot of emotion one, one of the emotions is, is is that of anger um, I'm sure this couple were talking about money. You know, uh, uh, th that barbed wire fence down the middle said something. So we, we, get, we get angry when we talk about it. There's arguments that create a lot, a lot of people will tell you that uh, divorces begin with this arguments about money. The, the other emotion is, 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 is one of fear. How many things have you been afraid to do because of finances? I, I'd love to be able to commit myself to a missions offering, but boy, I'm, I'm afraid that if, if I give to missions, I'm not even going to have enough money you know, for bread on the table. Or what about, if, if, if I spend this today, you know, what about tomorrow? And fear drives our decision making. But let me tell you, there's another emotion that we can, and that's hope. Even if you are in a difficult financial situation, there's hope. There's hope that you can get out. There's hope that you can clear your debt. There's hope that you can find a way to live even within your means. So we want to bring that hope to you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. For nothing is impossible with God. And what is impossible with men is possible with God, even in your finances. Nothing is impossible with God. So let me tell you about a fundamental law of economics. If you want to find the spot marked X, you have to do a simple financial exercise. It's called the OO law of finance. The first O relates to everything that you own. The second O relates to everything you owe. And when you subtract the one O from the other O, you get your net worth. And that's when you say, uh-oh. <laughs> or maybe zero, zero. Let me tell you what I mean. Let me show you an example here. Here's a gentleman who's got uh, a family that has a house worth about 450,000, vehicles worth 22. Some other property, maybe an RV, 48,000. They've been able to put some... Uh, uh, savings away in, in, in mutual funds or bonds for 17000 They've got some RSPs, maybe a TFSA, and a savings account. So their total of what they own is 550000 That's the first O. The second O is what they owe. The house still has a mortgage on it. Vehicle still a car loan. Still some money owing on that other piece of property. And, well, there we said we we're going to be open and honest about everything. There's that mother-in-law loan for 8000 <laughs> Everything they owe is 235000 So you take the 235, subtract it from the 550, their net worth is 315000 That's the spot marked X. 
We now know where you are financially. This is the number the bank will look for if you're going in for a mortgage or a loan. What's your net worth? So that's principle number one. Principle number two is set some goals. You want to be able to get from here to there. Now there's long-term goals, there's short-term goals. If you look at pages seven and eight in the booklet, they, they list a number of these goals and many of them are, are more general in nature. For example, everybody could say, oh, well, my goal is to get out of debt. That's a good goal, but let's do something a little more specific because you want your goals to be what we call SMART. You've probably seen this acrostic, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So instead of saying, my goal is to get out of debt, you say, no, what I will do is I will eliminate 25% of my debt by the end of this year. All of a sudden, that goal to get out of debt has a timeline on it. It's got something that's measurable. It's something that's specific. And you can know whether you've made progress in that goal. So that's all we'll say about goal. Let's move on to the third principle. Create a financial plan. First thing you do in your financial plan is make a commitment to God. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed, says Proverbs. It's interesting how often people will take and separate their financial lives from their relationship with God. As if, well... God's spiritual, this is money. Money is spiritual. As we talked about before, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Commit your plans to God. Then get help. Get help from people who are, are informed, who are reliable resources. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. There are financial planners, there are accountants, there are legal people, there are different ones that can give you help in this area. Probably one of the greatest people, though, that can help you is to find another Christian who is in implementing the biblical principles that we're talking about. They've already got them working in their lives. Let that person be a mentor to you. Let them counsel you and guide you along the way. They're maybe not perfect in their finances, but they've learned some hard knocks and they can help you. And sometimes that's the best help you can get. And then, invoke what we call the old MacDonald Law of Economics, E-I-E-I-O. You say, well, that sounds so corny. Yeah, but you'll probably remember it by the time we're finished it here. The first E-I is dealing with expected income. So we'll give you an example here. Individual whose income wages about 4150, some interest income of 198, some rental income of 750, they found maybe a, t a way to turn a hobby into a money maker, and they got another $300 coming in, so they got $5,398 worth of income. That's the first EI. The second EI is the expenses incurred. So they take and they give tithes of 540. Interesting how that the tithe turned out to be 540, and the income was 5398. We'll talk about that in a moment. Offerings of 175. Household expenses, including food and clothing, 950. Mortgage rent, 2250. Includes utility, vehicle payments, we said. RSP savings, 240. And then there's that other category of 698. Sometimes one of the most difficult things to get a handle on is where's our money going? Uh, if, if you've ever taken the time to actually write down what you spend. It's an amazing revelation sometimes where our money goes. Uh, on page 9 of your booklet, there's something called the 14-day challenge. See, sometimes there's money that just goes out, oh, well, a coffee here, a newspaper there, a magazine here, a little bit this, and you know, before you know, you've got this other category that has that huge amount of $698. If you have never tracked your spending, I would encourage you to take a 14-day challenge. And this doesn't have to be difficult, okay? You just keep the receipts from everything you spent during the day, stick them in your pocket or in your purse, and then at the end of the day, before you do your Facebook, just take three, five minutes <laughs> and put them into a, a, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. It'll automatically do the calculations for you, and it'll help you track it. And it, I mean, if it's something like fourteen ninety-eight, just round it off to fifteen dollars. We're not looking to be accountant type accurate here. We're just trying to get an idea where things are going. 
the very practice of tracking your finances will change your spending habits. I guarantee you. All of a sudden, you begin to realize, oh my goodness, look what I'm spending on this, or that, or whatever. You had never really thought of it before. I, I love to use the example of credit cards. Ask an individual, what's your credit card balance today? The majority of people have no idea. Then they get the statement in the mail, and they go, oh my goodness, who spent all that? It comes as a surprise, and they're shocked. Track your expenses, it, it's, it's a great exercise. So anyway, that's the expenses incurred. And so then, expected income, minus the expenses incurred, and we get a balance. That's called our outcome, E-I-E-I-O, of zero. And before we jump on this person and say, oh my goodness, you've got nothing left over at the end of the month. First of all, it'd be great to get many people in this situation. Most of it, it's a negative balance at the end of the month. There's more month than there's money. Secondly, if you have a surplus here, that means that there's a portion of your income that you're not tracking. You've missed it. Where's it going? And so it may be that God wants you to put a little more into savings. Or maybe he wants you to put a little more into giving. And so that you should probably come out at the end of the month with a zero, because that means you're looking after everything that God has entrusted to you. You know where it's going. And if it doesn't come out, if you do end up with a negative balance, you may then just have to set fire to your finances. By that I mean find income or reduce expenses. Most people they're doing the best they can in terms of finding income. Maybe they've taken on a second job. Maybe there's two incomes in the family. Uh, maybe they've already turned that hobby into a, a revenue source. Maybe they've got something going online. Most of us have, have worked pretty hard to find that extra income. It's the other one, the reduced expenses, that really is a challenge for us. And, and most economists, economists will tell you that the problem in Canada is not so much that we don't have enough income, we just have too much outflow. We are spending too much money. Our lifestyles have dictated that we overspend ourselves. So that's our deep-rooted rooted principle number three. The next one, number four, is to manage your spending. Well, there's several different players that come into play here. There's God, there's Canada Revenue Agency, there's you and your family, there's your employer, there's your creditors, there's your neighbors. Let's take a look at each one of these individually. God comes first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Seek his kingdom first. How do we do that? Well, in Malachi it tells us to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. People really get hung up on tithing. It, 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 it's such a stumbling block for some people. They say, well that's so Old Testament. That's so old law. Well, I mean, you can provide all kinds of, of uh, counterpoints and, and arguments, if you will, you know, show that right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, there was something that was set aside exclusively for God. I like to reduce it down to Proverbs 3.9. Honor the Lord your God with your first fruits. That's what it's all about. It's honoring God. It's saying, thank you, Lord. I recognize you as the source of everything in my life. Therefore, I return back to you this portion. The Bible says it's 10%. Fine, I go with that. But I want to give something back that says, Lord, this is yours. This has nothing to do with me. Because I simply want to say, thank you. I love you. That's why I tithe. I had a dear saint come to me one time and say, well, I'm so glad that you're talking about tithing. I have faithfully given the Lord 10% of everything for 40 years now. My outside voice says, bless you dear for being so faithful to God. My inside voice says, oh my goodness. Could your love for Jesus not have grown to 11% over 40 years or 12%? Tithing is a good place to start. It's a, ter start. it's a terrible place to stop. 
God calls us to generosity. Generosity is what he looks for. So, God comes first. Giving was hard when I was rich. Now it's easy. Got nothing. But you know, it really doesn't take much to be generous. I've got something here. Let me share with you. I had the privilege of going to Israel a while back. And while I was there, one of the things I wanted to do was pick up one of these little coins. It's called the widow's mite. Remember the story of the widow? Jesus and his disciples were standing there at the temple gate watching people as they brought in their offering. Now, Pastor, that would be an interesting concept, wouldn't it? Watching people put it in their offering. That's a sermon for another day. So they're sitting there watching them. And I'm sure there were people who came that day, they had bags of money. I mean, there's probably one guy came up with a whole bag of gold. From what we understand, Jesus never made reference to it at all. Only another guy came up with two or three bags of money. Never mentioned anything. Then this little widow woman comes up and puts in two of these tiny little coins. She had to put in two because that was the law. And all of a sudden Jesus says, Guys, did you notice? Did you see that? I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others, and all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Generosity in God's mind is measured not by the amount of the gift, but by the amount that's left. Somebody could come and give $100,000 to this church. That may be generous or maybe not. I don't know. It depends on what they have left. Somebody could come to this church and give $1,000 and that would be generous because of what was left. It's a whole different way of measuring generosity. And we need to be careful in our relationship with other people as to how much we give honor to somebody with big gifts. They may or may not be generous. Remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you... Did you get the message there? You will abound in every good work. So God comes first. Then comes the tax man. A friend of mine sat down one day and wanted to write a letter to Revenue Canada. Dear Revenue Canada. He thinks about it. I'm writing to cancel my subscription. <laughs> Please remove my name from your mailing list. <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. Now there is some good news. Kind of Revenue Agency encourages us even to give to God. Uh, the tax department promises a refund of 40% to the amount we give to the church. Actually, what we're doing is we're just giving, giving back what we've been deducted from our earnings. New, new tax laws allow us to receive tax credits for giving up to 75%, and estates up to even 10, 100%. But we do want to be responsible citizens. We do want to pay our share. We want to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. One tip we can give you, and probably some of you are just doing your taxes now, is get good advice. A lot of people leave money on the table that they could have had a refund for, but they just didn't fill in things properly. So make sure you get good advice. So first comes God, then the tax man, then you and your family. What I'm talking about here is saving. Um, Dave Ramsey, he's a financial, Christian financial guru from the States, he says the first thing you need to do is get $1,000 and put it in an emergency savings. Whether it, you know, do a yard sale, do something, raise that $1,000 and put it away. It's for emergency. A uh, new pair of shoes, not an emergency. It's for real emergencies. And just set it there. And then the suggestion is that you build that emergency savings up into you know, three months worth of income. There's different ways that we can save. Uh, 
there's what they call the day's do technique and basically what that is is you know all that change that you have left over at the end of the day just take it out of your pocket put it in a jar when the jar is full put it into a savings account so that, that doesn't work quite so well today because we don't use cash that much anymore so there's not that many coins left over at the end of the day there's certainly no pennies left uh, there, there's the plus technique plus 10 and basically what that is is find discover what all of your expenses are take 10 percent of that create another expense called savings so you just add it to your savings the other one and this one I like better is the minus 10 technique remember we already said we're going to take 10 percent off and give it to the Lord the next the next principle of financial success is pay yourself pay yourself so take another 10 percent and pay yourself and then live off the 80 percent now there's a novel new idea for a lot of people or in the wise, the idea is just to save for the house of the wise are stores of choice foods and oils but a foolish man devours all he has <coughs> then comes your employer well the only thing I'd say here is that this is probably one of the greatest sources both of income and expense income because well, I mean that's your wages come from there it's expense because you've got income tax CPP EI all of those types of things and the Lord calls us to be diligent employees then your creditors the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender a lot of people they, they tell me Ron you don't have to tell me it's bad to be in debt you don't have to tell me what a pain it is to be in debt how do I get out of it that's what I want to know well prudent man sees danger and gets out of it but the simple keep going and suffer for it so the first step in getting out of debt is no more new debt it's as simple as that this this also may mean no more credit card spending there are tests and, and experiments that have shown that individuals who pay with credit cards invariably pay more than with when they're paying with cash there, there's just something psychological that happens when you take cash out of your pocket and you give them a 20 or two 20s and all you get back is a couple of silver coins if something goes on in your mind says wow I just lost a lot of money here or spent it anyway as opposed to simply taking out a plastic card and going tap that's the way they do it now or just chip or whatever it's so much easier that way and sometimes we tend to spend more than we do so stop any form of borrowing then develop a spending plan we've already talked about that uh, how we're going to take care of it um, so a, a sp a spending plan can look like this in your booklet I think there's opportunity to write down some of those percentages basically your, your, your ties your taxes are going to come off the top this is your net income so you're putting money into housing food auto you also want to the other thing it does uh, it mentions there is savings and so this one says five percent but this is for the person who's looking to get out of debt so that other five percent is going into caring for their debt and so it makes it a little more difficult to save but you can do both at the same time some people tell me should I pay off my debts or should I pay into RSPs I said yes you know do both one's as good as the other so stop any form of borrowing develop a spending plan then work out a payback plan one of the worst things you can do if you're in debt is to ignore your creditors they get very antsy if they don't hear from you even if you can't make the full payment let them know what you can do let them know what you're going to do let them know you've got a plan and you are headed in a, in a certain direction you're gonna make it work let them know talk to them and then do what we call the snowball effect some people like to list all of their debts with according to the interest rate highest interest rate first pay those off I rather because remember at the beginning we talked about how emotional finances are I'd rather list all of the debts according to the smallest first up to the largest and then work at paying off that small one first why because it feels so good when you pay off that first debt you see a victory you see that you can actually do this it gives you encouragement so you pay off that first one and the amount that you were paying on that one all of a sudden you got free money no 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 what you do is you take the amount that you're paying onto that first one and roll that into the payment that you're making on the second one 
And then when you pay off the second one, take those two payments, roll it into the third one. And it's what we call a snowball effect. And it just quickly accelerates the process of paying off your debt. Then you may have to do some lifestyle changes. Maybe exercise some discipline. In one of the other courses I, I teach, it talks about living a Spartan lifestyle. Now you have to be over 45, I think, to know what Spartan means. But it really means you live a very restricted life. You know, KD and wieners, that's it. it, it it's you, you, you Limited spending on clothes, limited spending on food. You, you just live a Spartan lifestyle because you've got a goal in mind and you've got a target. So it takes self-discipline. Seek counsel, we've already talked about but that, but then learn to trust God. I think there are times when God is just sitting there waiting to say, oh, I'd like to bless him. Here's a challenge coming up. Here's a financial situation. He's going to need some help. I'm going to bless him. And then he gets interrupted because the person takes out the credit card and just puts it on, goes into debt to make that thing happen. Learn to trust God. Let him intervene in your life. So, God comes first, then the tax man, then your family, then your employers, then your neighbors, your creditors, and then your neighbors. Christianity taught the world charity. There's the story of the Good Samaritan. A man wanting to justify him asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus had said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And this person said, well, yeah, well who's my neighbor? Then he told the story of the Good Samaritan, how this man fell among thieves, and the priest and the Levite passed by. And then the Samaritan comes along, binds up his wounds, puts him on his donkey, carries him to an inn, pays for what he needs. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think was neighbor to this individual? And the expert in the law said, well, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. This is why I say that God's called us to generosity. You see, it's possible to give away and become richer. And it's possible to hold on too tightly and lose everything. The liberal man shall be rich, and by watering others, he waters himself. In this verse, in 2 Corinthians 9, probably one of my favorite verses. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Do you know that everything you receive from God has a seed portion to it? It has a bread portion to it. And bread is for our nourishment. Bread is for our enjoyment. Bread is what God supplies to make sure that we're looked after and we should give thanks to God for it and we should enjoy it because God wants us to live a healthy life. But there's a portion that's seed. What do you do with seed? I was in the Democratic Republic of Congo a couple of years ago, shared this verse, and I asked that same question, what do you do with seed? And they just laughed. They were an agricultural society. They said, well, what do you do with the seed? You plant seed. You plant seed. Everybody knows that. I'm convinced that one of the challenges of the Western church, certainly here in North America, whether it be the church as a whole or church individual, individuals within the church, is that we have failed to recognize what God has given us as seed. We thought it was bread for food and we ate it on ourselves and wondered why there was no harvest. We have consumed the seed. At that same seminar in, in the Congo, the guy who was translating for me, I was speaking in French and he was translating it into Lingala, their native language. He came to me later and he said, when we were teaching on, on the seed, he said, uh, God gave me a revelation. I said, what was it? He said, well, you just don't eat a seed. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, inside that seed are more trees, and on those trees are more fruit, and in the fruit are more seeds, and in those seeds are more trees, and on those trees are more fruit, and in the fruit are more seeds, and more seeds. He said, before you know it, you've eaten a whole forest. 
I said, that's brilliant. Not only do you eat a seed, but you eat the whole potential for harvest. Friends, I am convinced that our churches, God would love to bless our churches with more money if we knew what to do with it. If he was convinced that we could sow it as seed, he would give us more seed. I know this works in my life because God has actually challenged me in this area. A certain portion of income that I received wasn't much. God said to me, he said, what are you doing with it? I said, God, it's not much. He said, what are you doing with it? I said, well, I'll maybe buy myself a book here and there. He says, give it to me. I said, yeah, you can have it. It's not much. I gave it to God. All of it, and, and, and what I mean by I gave it to God was anytime somebody needed some help, maybe a missionary, maybe somebody who was in, in financial need, God would direct me to that and I would give it to the person out of this source of income. I, just, I, I went and opened a new savings account just to put that money in there. And out of that, I was able to bless people. Did you know that that source of income increased not only in amount, but in how, much, how often I received it? God takes and multiplies the seed. He does. Notice it said, doesn't he multiply the, 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 the bread? Doesn't matter whether you have two hollow legs like my you know, son. It, you can only eat so much. But you can always sow more seed. And as you sow it, he multiplies it. You know, people talk about getting wealthy in the, in the Lord. Here's how you do it. You give away every seed that he gives you and he multiplies the seed back to you. And all of a sudden, you become a multi-wealthy giver. I could go on for this, ever for this, but let, let me go quickly because we've got some things we need to take care of. Next one is planning for retirement. A couple are standing together in the street corner begging for money and she says to him, what happened to our retirement plan? He says, this is our retirement plan. What is yours? This graph shows the Canadian population in 1961 here on the left hand side about 7% were over the age of 65 and 42% were under the age of 19. They are projecting that by 2031 27% will be over 65 and only 14% will be under the age of 19. We are all that to say we're an aging uh, society. We're an aging society. So how do we prepare for our retirement? You know, I think my battery's going here. I don't know if you guys have opportunity to move those slides along, but if you could, that would be great. You help me out. So the next slide says, start with an RSP. Canada Revenue Agency informs you each year of your uh, notice of assessment how much you can spend on RSPs. Uh, the eligible amount is 18%, and, and then this coming year it's going to, so that's a maximum of 24930 and any unused amounts can be carried forward to future years. Uh, just some slides here that show the difference. If you start at age 20 with $1,000 per year, average interest of 6%, by age 40 you've got 42000 by age 65 you've got 239000 or more. That same person had just made a one-time gift of 10000 to his RSP, or one-time investment rather, same interest rate. Uh, at age 6, 40 he's going to have 32000 At age 65 he's going to have 137 maybe. That person says, okay, well, that's fine at age 20, but I'm, where were you 25 years ago? Well, even at age 45, if you give it 1,000 per year, average rate of 6%, that age 55, you're going to have 15,000, just almost 16, and at age 65, you have over 42. And if they could take and make that 1,000 into 2,500, you can see how quickly it grows, because at age 65, they would have 105,000. Now, obviously, if they'd started early at age 35 with that 2,500 a month, it would be 223,800. And if, you know, even at age 45, you can see that the difference that it makes on that next slide. So start with an RSP. Because remember, when you make a contribution to your RSP, Canada Revenue is going to give you a, a, an income tax deduction. So it's going to make uh, a difference in the refund that you receive. Uh, I know a lot of people who will. Um, at tax time, just take out a short-term loan for the amount of return that they're going to get and then just turn their return into uh, an RSP. And it, it works quite well for them. So start with an RSP. Take advantage of compound interest. That was in the examples I, I showed you there. It's just interest earning interest. And, and it's amazing how it grows over time. Time's your best ally. So, you know, the, the greatest time 
to start saving was yesterday, but the second best time is today. So let's get started when we can. Invest in mutual funds. These will be part of your RSP package. Then POC mortgage certificates. Uh, these are also available to you. What happens here is that we take and loan money to churches through to help them with their mortgages. And we have individual investors across Canada who will park money with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, probably getting double what they're going to get on a GIC. Uh, your GIC is probably around 1.5 to 1.9, depending on what you're investing in. At this time, you're not much, whereas our, our pending mortgage certificates are 3% or better, so you're uh, going to do much better there. And then there's gift annuities. Uh, these are basically a, a, a financial instrument that will provide regular payments for the rest of your life and the life of your spouse. Interest rates based on your age. The older the age, the higher the interest you'll receive. And all, a large part, if not all of it, is tax-free. Uh, you can talk to me about that. It makes the greatest sense for somebody who is 72 or older because then their interest rates become very interesting and the tax implications are very interesting. Then we need to do the final touches. Page 23 of your booklet, Estate Planning. While you're still here, you may need substitute decision makers. Uh, these are people who can make decisions on your behalf while you're still alive, but probably in a situation where you're incapable of making those decisions. Uh, there's decisions concerning your property and managing your investments. There's decisions also concerning personal care, uh, ongoing personal health care, or maybe end of life decisions. This is called power of attorney. We can help you with those power of attorney documents over today, tomorrow, and if necessary, Tuesday. The next one, you've got a, a husband or wife sitting on the couch having one of those rare moments of intimate conversation. And she, he says, just so you know, I never want to live in a vegetative state dependent on some machine. If that ever happens, just unplug me, okay? She says, okay. Probably not the machine he was talking about. <laughs> James 4, 13 and 14 says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend it the year there, carry on business, make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Do you know that three out of ten adults in a low-income bracket have not prepared a will? Or, have, or only three out of ten have a will? you need a new will or you need to update your will in a variety of situations. If you're over 18 years of age, if you're recently married or divorced, there are special family concerns, if it does not reflect your current thinking, if it does not provide for the Lord's work, if you're a new parent, these are all circumstances that could occasion either the update of your will or maybe even a new will. There's a lot of advantages to having a will. It avoids family conflict at an emotional time of loss uh, too many times. We've seen good Christian families become neither good nor Christian when it comes to dividing the estate. Controls the way the assets are distributed, it provides for special circumstances, and secures the future of minor children by naming guardians and trustees, and allows you to make provision for some of your assets to go to the Lord's work. And it may even save your estate some money. I'll show you that in a moment. So if you want to come and see me either today or the next couple of days with regard to a will, Here's some questions you need to ask and get, bring with the answers with you. Who will be the executor? Executor is a person who ensures that the uh, wishes of the will are carried out. Who will be the executor? And, and you need to name an alternate one. Of course, if you're married, uh, your spouse is going to be your primary executor, and you need to name an alternate one. And by the way, if you're coming to see me and you're married, then both of you have to come. I can't help just one at a time. You have to both come. Who will be the guardians for minor children? At what ages would I want the children to have the assets distributed to them? Do I want to give something to the Lord's work? And how am I going to get some help? Next slide shows what we call a traditional will. An example of an estate of 200000 Now, depending on how the will is written up, you may have an executor who would require a fee, 
there may be uh, probate fees, there may be administrative fees, they could end up being as much as 5% of the will. The surviving spouse then receives 190000 and then when that surviving spouse passes away, the same amount of fees are taken off. Again, the residue left for the uh, family, and in this case, two children, is 180 divided equally between them. Do you know how long it takes for the average beneficiary to spend his or her inheritance? Less than six months. <coughs> On all kinds of things. You can see that next slide. Now we do what we call a charitable will. We take that same example of the estate of 200000 and there are, the way we write it up is that, as we said, the spouse is the primary executor, and also everything goes to the spouse. So there's no private fees, there's no executor fees, there's, I mean, as executor, the, wife, the spouse is not going to charge themselves or anything. So there's no fees initially. Only when the surviving spouse passes away are there those fees. And then they give a charitable gift of 20000 Now, why would you want to give a charitable gift? Well, if you have spent your life honoring God with your first fruits, it would make sense that you'd want to continue that same value with your estate. Reaching lost people everywhere, planting, building churches, equipping and training leaders for Bible colleges and seminaries, caring for orphans, widows, feeding the hungry, if you look at the last four pages or so of your booklet, there's a number of ways in which the Pentecostal Assembly of Canada addresses all of these concerns, and there's opportunities for people to give charitably. So if you go to the next slide, that charitable will, the residue then becomes 170000 The first child receives 85000 The second child receives 80000 But in, in the, on the next click, it shows that there's about 8000 comes back to the estate as a tax refund because of the charitable will that you've given. 40%, as we mentioned earlier. So that if you take and divide that 40% between the two children, their inheritance is up around 89,000. And if you look back at the other page, and I think this is all on the, the page 30 of your booklet, uh, there's a very little difference then between the, what is received by those inheriting the estate. So a charitable will recognizes the blessing of God, expresses that personal philosophy of life, including others, generosity. It's part of storing up those treasures in heaven. It includes others, demonstrates value to family members left behind. It provides a sense of self-satisfaction. And then, of course, there's the tax receipt that you get from Revenue Canada. And then God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So this week we're here, the next couple of days anyway, to help you with these things. Please note, I'm not a certified financial planner. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a legal advisor. None of those things. But what I've tried to do today is bring to you the biblical perspective on our finances and stewarding the wealth that God has entrusted to each of us provide these sessions to you, no charge. Church helps us out with our expenses. International office covers my salary. So we can come and look after this and help you in these ways. Each session takes about an hour. Uh, do up the power of attorney documents, do up the wills, and you're taking care of, you leave with the documents, uh, at least the power of attorney documents, uh, right away. The others we take and get notarized for you. So. It's, it's a service that we offer, as I said, no charge, and I'm glad to help you. So if there's some way, there'll be a sign-up sheet down in the foyer, and Pastor, you'll probably instruct people further as to where exactly that is. We have uh, three sessions this afternoon, another couple this evening, and then all day tomorrow. And as I said, if we need to carry on into Tuesday, we'll do the same. Let me, let me close with prayer. I'm going to go back to that verse in 2 Corinthians. Now he who can see to the sore and bread for food. I want to pray that God will bless you, not only with food, but also with seed. Father in heaven, we thank you for you who are a generous God. If we were to sit down and count the blessings that we've all received, even this last week, it would be overwhelming. You are a generous God. 
Lord, you have blessed us so much in the past, and we know that you will continue to do so in the future. We thank you for the bread that you give us. We thank you for nourishing us. We thank you for providing for our needs. We are grateful, O oh God. But there may have been times in the past, O oh Lord, when we have missed seeing the seed that you gave us. And we, in our selfishness, thought it was bread for us, and we consumed it on ourselves. We ask your forgiveness. We repent and ask for your forgiveness. We pray to you, Lord, from this day forward that you would give us spiritual eyes that would see and discern the difference between the seed and the bread. And that you would again give us courage, because it'll take that to take and plant that seed, to sow it, to give it away. Lord, with, in our homes, exercising hospitality, using a portion of our home as seed, with our vehicles, giving people rides to the doctor, to the church, whatever. Using our vehicle, portion of it as seed. Whatever way we can, Lord, help us to see the seed portion and to give it away. Bless this church with your abundance of seed, O oh Lord. That this seed may be sown in this community. That your name be, made, be uplifted, honored, and glorified. Let this be known as a generous church Lord may your name be lifted up in this way so again we give thanks and we pray that you would help us in these things for we pray it in Jesus name Amen We hope you have enjoyed Jesus and me and we'll listen in again next week if you would like to know more about Jesus you can download our free Bible study Exploring Christ from our website kingsvillechurch.com just click on the media tab and scroll down to resources. If you would like to make a donation, giving to this ministry can be done on our website using PayPal. Scroll down to the bottom of our home page and click on the PayPal tab. All donations are tax receivable. May God bless you as you follow Jesus.